Hello, and welcome to Central Booking, where writers and readers are the authority. I'm your host, John Valeri. Today on Central Booking, we're coming full circle with the return of renowned attorney and best-selling author Marsha Clark. Marsha was my inaugural guest in April of 2020. At that time, she broke the news that she was working on her very first standalone novel after having written eight previous books across two series. And now that promise has been fulfilled with the publication of The Fall Girl. The Fall Girl introduces two main characters, Charlie Blair and Erica Lorman, a newbie to the Santa Cruz District Attorney's Office and a veteran prosecutor, respectively. Charlie is a former public defender from Chicago who has assumed a new name in the hopes of escaping her tragic past, while Erica is the darling of the DA's office, having just scored a hard-won celebrity conviction. The two are assigned as co-counsel on a high-profile murder trial, and it soon becomes apparent that neither quite trust the other, and that both have secrets to keep, the revelations of which could blow up their personal and professional lives. Marsha began her career as a criminal defense attorney and later made a name for herself at the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, where she was the first female member of the Elite Special Trials Unit. She currently practices appellate law in addition to her work in the entertainment industry. Marsha's first book was the number one New York Times bestselling trial memoir, Without a Doubt, which chronicled her work on the Simpson case. Her first series of crime novels featured by the book prosecutor Rachel Knight, while her latter series was headlined by a morally ambiguous defense attorney, Samantha Brinkman. While The Fall Girl was written as a standalone, readers are already clamoring for more. Reviewer Judith D. Collins gave the book five stars and enthused Captivating, her best yet, a taut, cleverly crafted murder mystery that will leave you guessing to the explosive ending. Now, Marsha Clark introduces us to the Fall Girl, whoever that is, and teases the surprising direction her writing may just take her next. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Central Booking. So today is episode 111, and I feel like this is sort of a full circle moment because my guest is best-selling author Marsha Clark, whose new book, The Fall Girl, is out right now. And Marsha, you were my very first guest 110 episodes ago as the world fell apart in April of 2020 and here we are again and the world is still kind of in disrepair but you and I we go on uh, we do we go on that's what we do John and I'm honored it was such an honor to be your first guest and here I am at 111 I feel very very honored to once again be here and You're this so time kind. <laughs> yeah not quite as locked down as we were no it's it's a little more free and so you know you said these nice things and I will now make that deposit into your bank account so that people who are wondering why <laughs> she's so kind, you know. There's a price Remember the account number. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So it's, it's actually interesting though, because that was, you know, a couple of years ago now, and we were talking about The Fall Girl then, even though I don't think it had a title and it's changed a bit, but now the book is a real thing. It's it out is. in the world. We are all devouring it and loving it. And I want to start with the title is sort of an introduction to this book because it's sort of deceptively simple and yet it packs a whole lot of subtext. So if you wouldn't mind using that as sort of a reference point in a non-spoilery way to give us a bit of an introduction to the story that people are gonna find between the covers here. So the, the tricky part of that question is non-spoilery. And I'm sitting here thinking, how am I gonna do that? Because how about this? How about I will just say, you know, that there are, you know, a couple of main characters in this book, and there's also a criminal defendant, and really any one of them can be the fall girl, can become the fall girl, but, you know, all right, we're going to do this because you're a veteran of the entertainment industry. I'm just going to say, if you had to give me an elevator pitch, what would this be? I know that that's triggering for a lot of authors, but I think given your history, you, you can probably manage that okay. Yeah, certainly not. You're going to need to edit me immediately because this elevator ride goes on for a very long time. But um, this is a situation where you have a veteran prosecutor who just won a big case and then is in danger for reasons unknown, hidden reasons for uh, potentially losing it um, after conviction because of something that happened, something she did. And she winds up working with a younger prosecutor who used to be a defense attorney and who is fleeing a tragic, horrifying event trauma in her life 
that has left her cut off from her family and friends and everyone um, and in fear for her life. And she winds up going incognito and winds up working with this veteran prosecutor in Santa Cruz, California, and begins to suspect things. Um, although this veteran prosecutor seemed to be her idol and someone she looked up to and wanted to be, she comes to suspect that she is not all that was cracked up to be. And she starts investigating her to find out what is her secret. That was a really, we're on the 48th floor now. <laughs> We go up and up and up. You know, let me ask you about Charlie because she's a really interesting character. And you just mentioned that she has sort of a past that she's trying to escape from. And on one hand, you know, she's very vigilant and security conscious. But then on the other hand, she also has moments of sort of absolute recklessness. And so there's that dichotomy to her. So I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about those aspects of her character. Yeah, so I really wanted to have to try on this idea because I think at the time, I was thinking about people that seem to be this and are that. And of course, nobody's all good or all bad, except for you, John. You're just all perfect. So you know, really I mean, there are exceptions bad. to every rule. <laughs> no. Anyway, um, like, like Charlie, in her case, is someone who really has had a, a decent life, is a decent person, um, had a horrible thing happen, a big, bad, horrible thing for which she blames herself. Um, substantially blames herself. And as a result of that, um, probably a streak that had always been there of self-destructiveness is one that becomes amplified. And when she moves to Santa Cruz to get away from that life and escape her world, um, that self-destructive streak really, really lodges itself in her brain, in her heart. And she can't resist doing things that are certain to get her taken out in a very violent or awful way. Um, and, and yet she's hiding that herself. She's not admitting it. She's just whatever, you know what I mean? It's like, what, uh, what tightrope? <laughs> I'm fine. And she keeps living that way until people start saying, um, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, eventually she does confront what she's doing with the help of a few others who are insightful about her. I think it's kind of em emblematic of all of us that other people can see things about us that we can't see in ourselves. So I wanted to show that too. Erica, um, her counterpart, that's the veteran prosecutor, she's like that too. She's a decent, fundamentally very decent, good-hearted person, a crusader rabbit who's out to do right by everyone and do justice, who finds herself doing something that is really not justice um, in service of what she believes at the time. Um, in a moment of panic, um, she does a desperate thing for a good reason, she believes. But it... You know, she really can't handle doing something like that. It eats away at her. It's it's driving her crazy. And ultimately, it is her self-destructiveness um, in doing that. And she doesn't anticipate the ways in which it will unravel her psyche. So you have two women that are really under a lot of emotional and psychological pressure that are both kind of disassembling in their own ways as they kind of circle around each other in this cat and mouse game. Yeah, it's really fun. It's a it's a great dynamic because you spend the entire time wondering, you know, where the chips are going to fall. It's just it's really fun to to watch them try to outmaneuver one another. And I think the fun thing about this book too, how many times can I say fun? Marsha Clark, you were fun. Um, but you know, I think people here, all right, Marsha's writing about prosecutors again. And so they think of Rachel Knight, who is very, you know, ethically bound and by the book. And here it's kind of prosecutors behaving badly, uh, but for good reasons maybe. So it's a completely, you know, it's a completely different uh, world, even though it's that side of the council table again. So I'm wondering, was this sort of a refresher, you know, a way to freshen up that prosecution story by revisiting that world, but from sort of completely different characters? Yeah, I think, yeah. I, I wanted to write more of a character piece than a procedural. And so I guess that's what's coming through. And because I really wanted to say, to talk about the pressures a prosecutor goes through and from two different points of view. Charlie was a dyed in the wool defense attorney and that's all she ever wanted to be. She was a public defender in Chicago and would have stayed there forever. But things happened to her, really bad things um, happened to her and those close to her um, in part because of her. And so she leaves that world behind and she wants to hide and goes, she gets a whole new identity and moves to Santa Cruz and becomes a prosecutor. Not an easy fit for her. She doesn't really dig that side of the lawsuit. 
And I really wanted to show a, a prosecutor who's conflicted that way in particular, because I think that's interesting when you have this devotion to the other side of council table. Erica, on the other hand, um, is somebody who is the died in the wool prosecutor. And she has been the one that's always been very straight and narrow and very, you know, by the book, very by the book. Um, and then she finds herself, she finds another layer of herself that is not so by the book. And I wanted to explore that. So that's why this, to me, is almost more of a character piece. I mean, not that there isn't action, because I have to be honest, there is, you know, right. there's there's action going on. But some of the action is psychological, too. So an emotion, because Erica's past is tortured, to say the least. And it comes up to bite her and explains in some part why she did what she did. And so I think it's also a story about two people whose past profoundly impact their present. Sure. And so let me ask you about setting, because both with Rachel Knight and Samantha Brinkman, those books were set, you know, in and around Los Angeles primarily, whereas now we've moved on to Santa Cruz, which is fun because, again, you know, it's a new backdrop to play with, and it lends some flavor, you know, literally, actually, because there's always fun eating and drinking in these books. But I'm wondering if you can talk about how place influences plot for you. Yeah, it, to me, it makes it feel completely different, you know, and I feel differently when I'm writing it. Um, I wanted to put it in Santa Cruz because it's a beach town, um, also a lot of forests and redwoods there. It's a beautiful place, but it's got definitely a seedy side, like big cities do, but it's not that big a city. It's it's smaller in, um, in, in breadth and scope, so it's kind of a pocket that isn't explored much, so I wanted to go for that, too. Also, because Santa Cruz is where Santa Cruz is where um, The Lost Boys was filmed, and that was that vampire movie. <laughs> what was it, about the 80s, John? I think I it was think, in the 80s. Yeah, probably, yeah. right? So fun with um, Jason Patrick and um, Kiefer Sutherland. Who else was in it? Uh, all these hot guys who are vampires. <laughs> where does it go wrong? And they do it on, and they're they on the boardwalk, which is a really cool, you know, um, iconic place in Santa Cruz with the Ferris wheel and all the rest, you have bands there and families there and stuff. But there's also right next to it, not far from it, is this place, this area that's really scary, lower ocean. So I love the juxtaposition of that. So there was all these kind of character-y kind of places. And yet at the DA's office, you could just walk to the beach. So there's that, that that was fun and different. Yeah, it is. You know, it's the beach and it's nice when it's sunny out and then the sun goes down and everything changes and you don't know what you're walking into. Um, yeah. And, you know, the book is going to make people hungry. I mean, there's a taco truck in this book and I'm still thinking about it. And I think I read this book in like June and I'm still thinking tacos, you know. <laughs> Yum. Well, you know, some of this is always wish fulfillment. <laughs> mm, I could really go for a taco right now. So Lupe has this little taco stand that is to die for. And everybody goes there from, you know, from our buddy Charlie to gangbangers to everything. So she goes there and it's in a bad neighborhood, this particular place. And late at night, of course, a woman alone. This is not smart. <laughs> and then she gets into it. She mixes it up with people there. So not smart either. The other place she likes to go to, this does not make you your mouth water, is the Rusty Nail. <laughs> yeah. And that's that dive bar that she goes to, also near Lower Ocean. So, you know, th there's all these places that have this kind of really rich character. They're gritty and they're grimy, but they're but some of them, like Lupe's, they made me hungry. Definitely. Yep. People, be forewarned. You know, you should have some snacks as you're reading the book. And... You know, I'm just going to say to people who are watching, because a lot of people like to gift books as presents. And the fun thing with your books is there's always a signature drink to go along with your characters. And so when I gift the Rachel Knight books, a lot of times I'll be like, and here's some Kettle One, you know, or if you gift <laughs> Samantha Brinkman, it's like, here's some Patron Silver. So it makes for a really fun present. And even if people aren't happy to see a book, they're like happy to see the bottle of booze that comes with it. So, you know. That's just my little two cents because the holidays are coming. So if you really want to win people over, you feed their wine <laughs> and then you give them a little uh, drinky drink. That is genius. Have this drink. No, have a few. You'll love my book then. <laughs> <laughs> You'll love it even more than you do when you are sober. Now I have to ask, I don't remember and I don't know if you do, but does um, does she have a signature drink in this book? I'm sure she does. What is it? <laughs> Charlie? 
Charlie yeah. doesn't. Charlie just drinks whatever she can get her hands on. You okay. know, I mean, that's she's definitely somebody who um, pours herself to sleep and, you know, and also she'll throw in a Xanax now and then whatever it takes to knock herself out. So she's not that picky. She's not a signature drinker because it doesn't matter. Well, that's good to know. I mean, one, I think that will probably make her even more relatable to a lot of people. <laughs> but also now I don't feel bad that I didn't remember it because there wasn't one. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to move into broader territory because, of course, we don't want to spoil anything. It is a mystery after all. Um, but so this, as I mentioned, is a standalone, at least for now. You know, that could change. You never know in this world. Um but despite your best intentions, this is your first standalone nine novels in. So your first four four books were Rachel Knight. Then you had four Samantha Brinkman books. You always sort of wanted to write a standalone. And now, you know, here it is, at least for the time being. So I'm wondering, you know, if you can talk about the, both the greatest challenges and the greatest liberties of having a completely blank canvas to work with for this story. So the first book in a series is like that too. Um, and I think the only thing you, that the only mindset that's different, even when you know you're starting a series, your first book in the series, is you have to make sure your character has legs, that there's um, somewhere to go and some more development to happen. And, and you want to set long-term goals, little short-term ones. And you, you have to think about those, that kind of longevity. But when you sit down to do a standalone, easy, easy, because a, all the characters are new, and B, they can stop right here in this book. So you don't worry about whether, geez, they're going to be able to do anything more with them, and what else What else can they get into these characters that will keep them engaged with each other intriguingly. Um, you don't worry about that. You just burn them up. So, <laughs> so that was kind of a fun, different thing to do. But as soon as I did it, I thought, you know, they could go on. I can see ways they could go on. So we'll see what happens. But I'm not planning on it. But you never, I've learned to never say never. Sure. Well, that's that's very smart. And you know, it's funny now that people are reading it and reviewing it, like all the comments I see are, oh, give us more, <laughs> give us more. So it's oh, good. It's oh, kind good. Of like, no matter what you do, people are going to want more, even if you don't intend to do that. But <laughs> we'll see. Unless, of course, you kill off all the characters, which, hey, maybe that well, happens. Then it's hard to go on. <laughs> yeah, no, then there goes. <laughs> oh, like, John, then they're ghosts. They're ghosts, right? <laughs> For the first time as well, you have sort of an alternating narrative here. You're shifting points of view. And so you have uh, Charlie, who is told through the first person, and then Erica in the third person. So I'm wondering if you can talk about what appealed to you about that structure and sort of how that helps to heighten the suspense of this piece. So I really personally usually prefer writing in the first person. All my other books were first person. But I really wanted to stretch and do third person. And I thought, wow, what would be even more fun is to alternate. So you have Charlie's in the first person, and then you have Eric, a third person. And it really helps to do that because you really do have to shift into a different mindset when you're writing third person. You have to think differently a little bit. Um, and it really it helps because if you're creating a different character with that different voice, third person voice, you really are shifting and you can use different almost language. You know, she's going to use language differently than Charlie is. Charlie's a little bit more rough around the edges than Erica. And so they speak a little bit differently. Um, and I think putting her Erica in the third person and alternating the chapters helps the audience too, to feel differently from chapter to chapter as they read, you know, the alternating voices. And I wanted to ask you, too, about the revision process, you know, which some people love that, some people dread it. Uh, but you talk about it a bit in the acknowledgement section of your book and how with, you know, every round of notes you got, the book would change and it would get better. And I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind speaking to that process and telling us, you know, if you recall a bit about how the book evolved from its initial idea to what we actually find here in its finished form. Yeah, I, so I, I started out with the idea of alternating voices. I definitely knew I wanted to do that. So that was a given. Um, and then coming up with the, the ultimate premise, I knew kind of what I wanted in terms of Erica. Had a feeling about Charlie, but I needed Erica's dilemma to make sense for her. I don't want to have a cartoon character who is a prosecutor who suddenly you know, goes invisible and and shoots from her eyes and, you know, that kind of thing. I just really like to do things that are 
largely believable and stretch them out a little bit. You got to pull it out a bit, but I'm, I'm not into the whole ridiculous kind of story. So in the beginning, it was a question of discovering the right premise. And that premise was important because it was going to also fire up Charlie as well. It had to be something that would drive everyone. Um, so that was one thing. But then when it came to sitting down and actually writing it, it really did impress me that writing is rewriting because it really needed it needed trimming here, it needed amping there, it needed different kinds of scenes because it's a different kind of book, much more character based. So there needed to be more emotional scenes with greater um, emotional impact and personal depth and experience. And so um, getting I the most fabulous editing notes I probably have ever had from Genevieve, um, and I have her in the acknowledgements, um, who would say, I want more, more here and more there and more here and more there. And I think at the time, yeah, but I want to keep it, you know, the, my, the mantra was, you know, our team, keep it tight, no more than 300 pages. And I've always been a blabbermouth. So <laughs> it's always, you know, going too long. So I really wanted to keep it tight. So every time she wanted me to add a scene, I'd say, oh, damn, it's going to get longer. But then it was like, oh, no, but you could cut over here, you know, and ultimately that process of rewriting and rewriting taught me so much. It was a really exciting time, actually. Um, I've never enjoyed the process more than I have through this book because um, it was such a learning experience and so exciting to stretch that way. It was yeah, really cool. So that's refreshing to hear. And I mean, the book is, if you look at it, you can tell it's lean and mean. I think it clocks in at like 302 pages, which, yeah, for you, that's like 100, 150, 200 pages less than some of the other ones. You know, I don't think I'm ever going to do that again, honestly. You know, I, might, I mean, I don't think I want to ever get any longer than this. I think I don't want to read a book that goes that long. You know, I remember being daunted by some really great authors just because, you know what, I have more things to do. I'm going to work. And I sometimes have to eat dinner. So it really, as much as I love to read, it, it can really hamper the experience if it goes too long. It does seem, it can be, can be. Some writers really are those kind of writers that they can go on for a thousand pages. Doesn't matter. It's just beautiful. But but for me, I think I'm just self indulgent when I go too long, and that's not good. And I don't want to do that to the readers. Well, that's impressive self reflection. I don't know when the when the arc arrived. I was like, wait a minute, this can't be it. This this doesn't weigh enough. The envelope is <laughs> really skinny. I'm like, is it missing the ending? Is this some new gimmick? They send you like half a book. <laughs> But it's fun yes, it's just half. Yeah, <laughs> part one. So anyway, when people think Marsha Clark, I think so many of us think prosecutor because you know that's what everybody saw, that's what everybody's come to know. But you started your career as a criminal defense attorney, and you currently practice appellate law. So I'm just wondering if you can tell us both in terms of factually or in real life, and also fiction. How does having sort of that broad perspective? help you? And then, you know, here's the John Valeri infamous two-part question. In what ways, you know, does working in appellate law keep your head in the game, even though you're not necessarily in the courtroom every day anymore? So ha being, having been on both sides, and now as much as a, a defense attorney as I was a prosecutor, um, as much time equal. And it does give you a, a great perspective in terms of understanding both sides of it, and also knowing um, how to spot the flaws and how to spot the strengths, how to spot the weaknesses, how to spot the the missteps um, on both sides, which is really, um, it's, it's, a, it's a cool perspective to have. It also lets you feel emotionally what is, um, what are the driving forces on, on both sides for the defense as well as for the prosecution. I think that the criminal law would benefit by requiring everyone to practice on both sides of the lawsuit. Defense attorneys be prosecutors for a minute, prosecutors be defense attorneys for a minute, get a, get a flavor, get a sense of what it's like to fight for the other side, because then you can really understand, um, I think a basic sense of justice, more balance to your view, which is always good, always good. And it gives you, it's always good, I think, to have the ability to see through multiple lenses, not just one lens. And it gives you a richness and depth of understanding. And that's to everyone's benefit. It's particularly to the benefit of writing, because then you can be in different shoes. So I think that's where it really is fun to be able to 
like write a char a Charlie type character who is still kind of a defense attorney at heart, but really does embrace the idea of being a prosecutor. She gets it now, um, and it's it, it gives you um, more layers to play with. Wait, what was the second part of the question? I always forget. It. Sure. Well, I, I should know better. You know, even as I'm writing this, I'm thinking to myself, just make it two questions, John. Obviously, I need editorial feedback. But second part of the question was just appellate law is a bit different in that you're not in oh, yeah. the courtroom every day, but it sort of it keeps you in the game. So I'm wondering if you could just talk about, you know, how that keeps you in it, even though you're not practicing law in a courtroom anymore. It's a really good question, John. Um, not that the others weren't great. They were all fabulous. <laughs> all clocked, it was leading up to this. <laughs> but um, it does because what I have what I have to do every case consists of the transcripts from the courtroom. That's what the whole appeal is based on, and it's based on only that. So police reports or whatever somebody else might want to tell me, <clears throat> I can't use. I have to focus and dial in on exactly what happened in court. But in the process, I get to see all the witnesses, the prosecutor, the defense attorney. I get to see. Um, some work from the defense side, I get to talk to defense attorneys and, you know, see how they felt about whatever was going on in the courtroom. So it's a constant um, involvement and immersion in what's happening in the courtrooms today, right now, in today, you know, so um, it keeps things fresh for sure, because that's the whole basis of the appeal. I kind of love that because, you know, we see you on TV, we see your name on book covers, and it's like you're still slogging away at it because... You know, you love it. And I think that that really says something. Um, slogging away at it is a very good Slogging away at it. <laughs> Feels like that all the time. Right? <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, so I wanted to ask you, too, about your friend, Kathy Lepard. And we're going to get to the audio book in a minute. But, you know, I recognize that name, again, from all of the acknowledgement sections, because she's not only a good friend of yours, but she's a creative collaborator, a first reader. And before you actually, you know, sort of took that dive into novel writing, she really kind of encouraged you to follow that dream, even though, you know, you were kind of a bit leery to do that. So I'm just wondering if you can tell us a bit about what your relationship is with her and why it's important, especially for creatives, to have somebody like that in their lives. Yeah, you know what, it's so critical. I think, I think most authors um, really do try to find that person, whether it's a friend or, or a family member or whatever. But that person has to be good. <laughs> that person has to be um, somebody who understands the genre, someone who's very literate. And to have somebody in addition who's a fabulous writer like Kathy, um, that's the gift of all time. That's an amazing thing. So you have somebody there who can say, tweak the line like this, make it sound like that. I don't know that this works. Uh, and they're right. And she's always right. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible gift to have someone like that. Um, to, to advise and to do, to be your first reader and third and fourth reader sometimes. I, I have to apologize always for torturing <laughs> her. It's really not okay. But it's also really fun. And, and what I love most actually um, in, in our collaboration is when we get to write scripts together, because she's an amazing script writer. That's her area, is writing scripts for television and for film. She's amazing at it. Amazing. Somebody who can write drama as well as comedy, which is unusual. She's really funny, but also really profound. So, you know, I, how can you do better? It's a, it's, an, it's a wonderful thing. So segueing into this book, when they asked me to, to be the narrator, which I had not done before with the other books of fiction, I said, I really don't think it's going to work with just me narrating both sides because this is alternating chapters. <coughs> sorry. And so, <coughs> think of water. Sorry. Go for it. Yeah, water. Okay. <laughs> Get that stuff. <clears throat> no, because it's clearing in a bottle does not make it water, Marcia. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's too early. <laughs> You're three hours later. It makes sense. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> um, so I, I was really worried about that. I said, you know, I, I think I need to find someone else to do it. And they were like, you know, talking about various other narrators, actors, whatever. And I thought, well, wait a minute, I know someone who really knows how to act, who can actually do it. Kathy knows how to give a line reading like no other. She's amazing. And I mean, I've seen, we've done it together, you know, and just reading the book. And I said, if I can get her to do it, let me just show you how good she is. So we sat down and recorded um, a few pages together to show them how it would be. And they said, yeah, that's great. 
And so we narrated the book together. Um, and unfortunately, not literally together. They they had a studio at separate times. But mm-hmm. it was really, it was such a cool thing. And she's fantastic. So you're going to hear, she's Erica, and I'm Charlie. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's so much fun. I've been listening to it a bit online. And I think that people are going to love the personal touch because we sort of already know your voice. But when you're familiar with somebody and you hear them actually telling a story, I think that sort of elevates it. But like you said, Kathy, too, is is so dynamic that it's almost like listening to like, you know, a broadcast play or something. It's just it's a lot of fun. It's really dynamic. And it's it's kind of fresh. You don't often get that when it's two friends recording a novel together. Um, But I wanted to ask you about the actual process of recording as well, because I feel like it's one of those things that can be an incredible amount of fun, but also, you know, a bit frustrating too. It's really, um, I had a fabulous team recording me. The director, the engineer, they were just wonderful. Um, And I had never done this before. I, I had narrated the book, you know, without a doubt. I did. You know, but that's nonfiction. That's not the same. And this is a dramatic reading. This is something that, you know, you have to give it real life and real um, drama. You have to act, (laughs) I guess, is really the answer. And I really, um, without getting, if I had not had such great direction, I think I would have had a really hard time with it because I am so self-critical and I hate the sound of my own voice. So... I knew that I wouldn't be able to go home and like listen to what I'd done and fix it the next day. I just, I can't bear it. So thank goodness I had wonderful people. And so they jump in and they stop you and they'll say, do it again. Try like this. This was too, this a little slower, a little faster. Give it a little more energy. Give it a little more emotion, you know, and then, you know, talk you through the rough patches and stuff. So I had plenty of help um, that I was so grateful for. And so I liked doing it, but I have to say it's a it's a totally exhausting thing to do. Like by the end of the day, like there would be a break. We'd do, go for three or four hours and then we'd have a lunch break. Mm. And I would just curl up on the couch and, and roll up in a ball. <laughs> so I, I, for like 15, 20 minutes, because I just, all that talking, <laughs> it's a right. lot of talking. And by the time I got done for the day, I didn't even want to pick up the phone. I mean, I just, no, no uh, that's enough. My too much jaw moving. <laughs> right. So it so it can be really, you know, it's it's it does um takes a lot of energy, but I hope you like it. I know that once you described your life is a mosaic. There's just a lot of pieces that come together and there's not room for extra pieces. And I think as people are listening to this, they're they're probably realizing that you live a very full life. You know, you're not just writing books and doing appellate law, but you're working on podcasts and television projects. It's it's a lot. So I'm just wondering if you can expand on that notion of the mosaic and how it is, you know, in a typical day that you try to balance all these different facets of your work. Uh, <laughs> I know. Huh? I don't. Um, it's funny. I, I I actually physically make myself at the end of every day think. Okay, now what am I going to do tomorrow? Because I have to decide. So in the morning, I'm going to work on the podcast, and in the afternoon, I have to do these briefs, and I have to do the brief on Mr. X, and then I have to do, um, you know, whatever the next um, article I want to would do, whatever it is. You know what I mean? So I have to. I map out my day and then I immediately blow it every morning and start with something else. (laughs) Just decide, nah, I'm going to start with the brief first and then I'll get to the podcast and then I'll get to the, you know what I mean? So I always think I've got this plan and that makes me feel good. I can like, you know, close the computer at the end of the night and say, okay, I know what I'm doing tomorrow and then do something completely different. So, (laughs) but it's, but it's nice to have that autonomy. You know I mean? That's a, I mean, it, yeah, my days are packed. I mean, it's, and it, there, there's no, I don't think I ever take a day off. That said, that's the way I want it. You know what I mean? That's my choice. And so if it's your choice, it's not so bad. It's like if somebody was making me go into an office every day, seven days a week, I think I'd quit <laughs> if I could, you know, but, um, or find another job if I could. But it, because it's you and you make your own ch- choices about how you're going to use your time and how much you're going to spend, it's okay. I like it. It certainly makes every day different. 
I, I'm impressed that every night, you know, you actually think about what your plan for the next day is going to be, even if that's not what actually ends up happening. Um, I feel like, wow, you are a glutton for punishment because at the end of the day, the last thing I want to think about is tomorrow. <laughs> like, I'm just like, all right, oblivion, oblivion, oblivion. Um, but, you know. Well, you're smarter because, you know, it obviously does me no good. It's just one of those um, habits that lets me relax at the end of the night. Sure. Okay, I know what I'm going to do, not yeah. forget about it. Yeah. And yep. it's stupid. I may as well save that time because I'm never going to do that. Oh, I don't know. I disagree with you. I think it's very smart, though. Somehow it works, and you now have, like, 10 books to your name among all of these other things, you know, that you've done with your life. And I always think, too, you know, for the one thing that we see with your name on it, there's probably nine others that we haven't seen yet. And I'm like, that's how it gets done. You just you keep throwing things at the wall, and you see what sticks. And if something falls down, you pick it up, and you throw it back at the wall. My problem is I don't pick up the things that don't stick. I eat them. <laughs> I don't know. I'm learning a lot about myself tonight, Marcia. <laughs> we always do, John. We always do. <laughs> In terms of a creative life or a writing life more specifically, what do you think is the best advice that you were ever given? But then the flip side to that coin, what is the best advice that you were never given and had to learn for yourself throughout the process of actually doing the work? I think the best advice that I was ever given is be relentless. Um, that means really be relentless. Relentless is not just don't give up. It means you keep going um, and you keep going and you keep going and you keep trying and you keep knocking on doors. Um, eventually one will open, but that requires you to have an open mind about what is a door? Um, because I think too often people, um, oh, this is the advice I was never given. I, I'm segueing from one to the other. I was given the advice, be relentless, don't give up, keep going for it. Because it by no means is, um, did I get my first book published? No, by no means. And thank God <laughs> when I think back on them. So got saved from myself, which is a good thing. But, um, but the best advice I was never given is to not limit what you consider to be a door. So you may think what you want to do is write for magazines or, you know, online. And what you want to do is write these uh, articles, be they political, personal, sociological, whatever, pop culture, that's your thing. That's your jam. And you don't, you're not hitting it there. It's not getting, it's not satisfying for you. Or you're not getting any traction. But what you fundamentally want to do is write. That's it, right? So think about another way of writing. It's consider what your door is. And, and try to find another definition for it. So maybe the door is writing a blog. Maybe the door is trying to write for um, a newspaper. Uh, maybe the door is writing a book um, or, you know, whatever, a script. You know, all of these are different ways of writing, but they're all writing. So I think it's that. It's like don't narrow your options and insist it has to be this one thing or this one way. Keep your mind open to other possibilities other ways of doing what you want to do. That's outstanding advice. That's some really good perspective. And I don't think that's something I've heard on the show before, which is nice when you can do 111 oh, episodes and hear something fresh. So, you know, kudos to you for, I love that, you know, reconsider what is a door. That's, that's terrific advice. And, you know, I just have to say, um, you know, as you mentioned a couple of times, it took you a while to come to novel writing, to really embrace that as something that you felt comfortable and confident doing. And I don't know if you know this or not, but for the longest time when you were first publishing books and getting all these terrific reviews and hitting bestsellers lists, there were a lot of people who thought that you had a ghostwriter because they were like, she just can't be this good. And I always laughed at that because I thought if Marsha Clark, you know, was going to ghostwrite mysteries, do you really really think she would have waited that long to do it like what sense does that make <laughs> it's true god that's true why not do it right away you know what i mean <laughs> yeah and that i you know i don't know i thought it was really funny when i first heard that and i think it was barbara peters the you know poison pen owner um favorite bookstore and um she thought for sure somebody had ghostwritten rachel knight <laughs> and she demanded an actual affidavit from my publisher Oh my gosh. <laughs> to, to say, just to promise that I really did write it. It was pretty funny. And I, yeah, why would I wait this long? Just <laughs> That's a very good question, John. I'm going to remember that. <laughs> Next time go. somebody says, 
<laughs> that's so funny about Barbara Peters. I mean, she is a formidable like force of nature, she but is. now you're like the best of friends. So that's hysterical that she would actually her. demand proof that you are the author yeah. of, you know, the books that bear your name. Um, yeah. So yeah. last question, you know, I always like to leave with a bit of suspense, a bit of a teaser. I'm wondering if there is anything that you are at liberty to divulge about what might come next for Marsha Clark, whether it's a book, a podcast, something completely different. Is there anything that you can tease? Well, there's two possible things, but I can't say much. Um, there's a podcast, a true crime type podcast that is really focused on a central character who is outrageous and it's all true. Um, and working on that right now with a podcast company, really fun. Um, and then there's also a true crime book. I'm looking at the possibility of another fascinating character based story. Um, yeah, that's as far as I can go. Right well, hey, that's that's promising. So maybe a podcast, maybe a true crime book, which again, that feels like a very fitting and sort of natural uh, progression of your career as an author. I mean, I don't think that people will be surprised by that. It'll be like, what took Marsha so long to write a true crime nonfiction book? That's you, you would have actually have thought I'd do that sooner. <laughs> but no, I mean, that's when right. I first started writing, all I wanted to do was make stuff up. So <laughs> So we should probably say, since you mentioned Barbara Peters in the Poison uh, Pen Bookstore, which is outstanding, uh, if people want signed copies of The Fall Girl, they are going to be available through the Poison Pen. So check out their website uh, and you'll be doing a virtual event with them uh, coming up in September. And also your publisher, Rare Bird Lit, you can see their little emblem right there. They also are making signed copies available on their website. Hopefully that's your signature, right, Marsha Clark? Do we need you bet it is. To yeah, it is. Signed by me. But, you know, if people want the John Hancock of Marsha Clark, there's a couple of ways to get it now. So, again, uh, Poison Pen Bookstore online or Rare Bird Lit online, and you can have not only a Marsha Clark book, but a Marsha Clark signed book. I mean, what could possibly be better? So here we are at the end again, Marsha. Just here waiting. Here we are, John. We did it again. <laughs> we did it again. Thank you. You are a patient and tolerant person. Thank you. You are an awesome interviewer and so much fun as always. That's it for this episode of Central Booking. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing.